Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar session 51. Since the last 18 months, Progenesis Academy has been actively involved in creating education program for the embryology community. To access all our previous webinars, please check our website progenesis slash academy. You can also check our YouTube channel, Progenesis Academy. If you subscribe, you will be able to get the notification when new content is available. Today's topic is current status and the future of embryology and reproductive genetics. We have invited a geneticist, an embryologist, a fertility specialist, and a scientist who are well-versed in technology. Introducing Gary Harton. He is the chief scientific officer of Bioscribe Genomics. Dmitry Drotsev, he is the laboratory director at Advanced Fertility Center of Texas. Rohi Gupta, he is the chief scientific officer at Tomorrow Life Sciences. And Alejandro Chavez Padula, he is the medical director at New Hope Fertility Center and founder at Embryo Ranking. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for joining us. This is really an exciting topic. I'm so excited to see everyone's perspective on the, uh, the, the uh, future of embryology and reproductive genetics. I'm going to start just my first question uh, to any one of you to give us a scope where IVF was 50 years ago and where is it now? And maybe we can start with you, Dr. Chavez. I believe that we have made huge advances in every single area. But strictly speaking, I think that these, the advances leading to improved pregnancy rates are mainly in the lab. I think that there are advances on quality controls. And unfortunately, I believe that these advances have been very slow. These are dramatic advances. If we take into consideration the pregnancy rates uh, in the late 20, uh, 70s, to what we have now, I think that we have gained a lot, but this again has been very slow. I believe that we are entering a new era, what I call IVF 2.0, where we will be able to achieve very clear advances with the use of automation, artificial intelligence, uh, and even synthetic cells. So I'm very enthusiastic about what is to come. I think that we are in a privileged position uh, to influence uh, how medicine is medicine uh, is going to move forward. And, and again, uh, this is how I see it. Again, since the late 70s, very, very poor pregnancy rates. It was what we had, a limited technology, limited knowledge, very brave scientists pushing and working hard to move science forward in the benefit of patients. And again, right now, we are in a privileged position to generate uh, speed science and push forward very, very quick in improving pregnancy rates. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Dimitri, when you look at um, ICSI, ICSI came only in the last, what, maybe uh, uh, more than 10 years. What was the, um, you know, uh, the outcome before and after ICSI. Did you can you tell us a little bit about that transition uh, before and after ICSI? Sure. Uh, well, I mean, ICSI when it came out in '92, not everybody believed that it's it's possible. <clears throat> um, and uh, when people tried to duplicate it, they struggled. Uh, so uh, it wasn't immediately clear that it's. Uh, really something which would work. And if you remember before that, uh, we tried the uh, um, SUSI, PZD, like we're trying to put uh, sperm calls together. And uh, uh, because uh, everybody at the time involved in the field was uh, was a hardcore you know, biologist like Jacques Cohen and uh, people of his caliber. <clears throat> we were trying to avoid everything uh, which would not imitate natural fertilization. And this idea that you can just stack the sperm into the egg uh, uh, just didn't uh, sit well. It, it just it didn't seem possible, even though Yanagimachi you know, 
uh, showed that you can do it on, on a hamster, you can get fertilization. And Susan Lanzendorf, we should also give her credit, uh, was the first one to obtain fertilization uh, in humans. She wasn't allowed to transfer embryos because the uh, ethical committee said it's not safe. They didn't believe that uh, this kind of fertilization can uh, be used clinically. Uh, so it took uh, the genius of uh, Jean Pierre Palermo to um, polish technique and make it clinically useful. Uh, uh, so um, it completely revolutionized without any questions uh, IVF because um, for the first time we had a tool in our hands which would uh, assure fertilization, which was never assured. Like uh, uh, fertilization was uh, the major frustration of IVF. Would never knew if it's going to fertilize and fertilize. Why it would not fertilize? It would blame it on everything and sperm and endometriosis, you know, uh, uh, PCOS, whatever. Anyways, um, yeah, it, it was huge. Uh, uh, and uh, from uh, probably 96, uh, uh, ICSI became ubiquitous and it completely changed IVF. And, and the, yeah, the ability. Yeah, okay. If I might, Nabil, I just I just want to say one thing about you know I, I started in the field I think like like at least that Dimitri did when you know ICSI was it was before ICSI, and so the other thing about ICSI is you know it it's it's opened up IVF to a whole new population of people that we we couldn't offer IVF to right the male factor people male factor <laughs> patients there was no choice there was no way to, to go through IVF, so I think you know ICSI is is one of those watershed moments that that really opened. Um, up the, the technology to a whole new set of patients. I also always say about ICSI, you know, people give us geneticists, us PGT guys, Nabil, you know, I know you hear it too. Oh, you know, where's the clinic, where's the definitive clinical trial that shows that PGT works? I always say, where's the definitive trial that showed that ICSI worked? The answer is <laughs> there isn't one, right? I've had this conversation with Andre von Sturdigum himself and said, you didn't do the trial. You got, you know, you got lucky that it, it's great. But in the end, you know, there was no clinical trial. There was no data. They did it. They published it. Everyone went and, and they showed how everyone how to do it. And it's interesting and it's great that it worked. But I think it's a lesson learned in, in new technologies coming into the field. As Dr. Chavez mentioned, it's we're in a golden time of, of new technology. But one has to understand how to put them into, into play and use them and, and, and talk about them and, and make sure that, that everyone in the field understands them. Yeah, and if I can jump in and just add to what Gary said, because he, he just made it me say this, uh, uh, what one stared at him in all this group, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, uh, there was no way in hell that uh, <laughs> I, uh, that ICSI could come from from the United States. It would just not be possible. It had to come from uh, uh, Europe, where at the time uh, ethical standards were very, very low, if there were any standards at all. Uh, so you had a combination of technology and no ethics, which is very, very productive. But even then, they could not publish it in Lancet, uh, claiming that uh, they did this on purpose. The article said that uh, injection was made by error. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right. yes. I mean, this is pretty much what, what I was uh, trying to, to say in brief. It was, I think that up to probably before the 2000s, this was the era of very, very brave scientists yeah. trying to push uh, all the boundaries of science to in the, in the benefit of patients. And I think that, or at least how I explained it to, to my uh, junior doctors, medications ha had a great impact. Simulation medications had a great impact on IVF because that was the only way to overcome uh, all the poor results that the lab was generating at first, but scientists such as you were pushing science forward. We're getting better and better results. Now we have ICSI, we have vitrification. We have many more tools that now are improving uh, the amount of embryos that we have at hand. And now we have to control what we're doing in the sense of what do we do with these many embryos? We're not going to transfer five at a time. We're not going to transfer two. Now we are in single ember transfer. And so there yeah. was a, a trigger point where, you know, um, 
IVF labs were not able to grow the embryos till day five or day six for transfer. And what was that change that made the lab so efficient now that you can grow the majority of the embryos till blastocyst stage? What was the change in the, in, in the technology, Dimitri? Well, to, uh, <laughs> uh, you asked me a question which is uh, difficult uh, and also, I guess, uh, political because, you know, when you talk about something where people still alive, you know, <laughs> It's, it's always uh, uh, it's always difficult, but in any case, uh, I mean, generally speaking, uh, obviously the development of cultural mediums or media, um, and as you know, it came through several uh, reincarnations uh, from a multi-step medium when we believe that uh, environment of uh, fallopian tubes and then uh, transition into uterus has to be imitated in vitro, like five, six steps medium, uh, and now we have. Uh, you know, one step medium, every company which was making multiple step now making one step. But um, uh, uh, I think that uh, improvement came uh, from work of uh, uh, Yana Gimache, who found the reasons for two cell block, you know, so that uh, 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 I believe that uh, uh, amount of pure weight, pyro weight had to be adjusted in culture medium. It was uh, one of the major changes and, and glucose uh, had to be changed. Uh, but uh, then there were incremental adjustments by multiple people. Uh, uh, among them, I guess, uh, um, uh, what would be the names? Um, um, my God, I'm afraid to miss somebody. Well, you can't, so, you, you can't skip David Gardner. Right? Yes, I mean, of course, David Gardner, absolutely. No, no, no Gardner, absolutely, David Gardner. <laughs> but but, but, but there were also... You know, yeah. Yves Menezo, I mean, you know, Yves Menezo was an amazing biologist in the yes. early days of IVF media that, that knew more about IVF media than anybody I've ever talked to, including David Gardner. I think for yeah. me, those, those two were the, the two that, that for me really pushed the, that part of the field forward. Yep, yeah, absolutely. But I, I just still, uh, uh, I still want to bring the names which people know Gar David Gardner uh, and uh, the, the nominees, but what they don't know you know much. I was shocked that uh, uh, when I made a survey uh, among young embryologists, almost nobody knows who the hell you know much was or Epic, you know. Uh, so, uh, 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 and these people have to be given credit for uh, for uh, medium development uh, because it all came from mice and uh, and animals, animal husbandry. Um, uh, but uh, so there were improvements in, in, in uh, obviously, culture medium, which made this possible. Absolutely. And from a genetic perspective, so we, we knew that till maybe 2015, uh, before that, majority of the clinics will, would be using a day three embryos for PGTA testing. Uh, now it has become almost non-existent. Uh, all, all clinics are using day five. What the outcome looks like, uh, uh, Gary, the outcome of day three and day five, before and after? Well, I think, you know, I think anybody that's a molecular biologist will answer the question and say having four to six cells is way better than having one. I think so. For me, that's that's a it's a big change um, in, in the business. So being able to do blastocyst biopsy. Um, I think also being able to vitrify embryos and, and the work by, by, again, as Dimitri mentioned, by many, but I think Bruce Shapiro in particular with the freeze all, um, the freeze all concept that, that all sort of coalesce together to, to really make genetics, uh, genetic testing uh, a really, really easy option that, that any clinic could offer. You know, in, in the early days of PGT, not every clinic had people that could biopsy. There weren't that many laboratories to send samples to. You're sending single cells spread on a glass slide for fish that wasn't great. Um, so I think beyond day three versus day five, Nabil, I think that there's been a lot of, of forward uh, pressure in, in, in PGT that's come from the IVF side, right? Being able to grow embryos to day five, that's or six and seven, that's a huge change. Being able to vitrify embryos, a huge change. Um, genetic counselors coming into many more practices is a huge change. So I think there's been <coughs> lots of really, really positive changes in the field that have allowed the genetics, the geneticists here uh, to, to really uh, have more to say what goes on in, in IVF. 
Yeah, that's yes. Great. Well, as somebody, uh, of course, uh, thank you very much, uh, Marlene English. She yeah. uh, she put the names here: Patrick Queen, John Riggers, a lot of people. Yes, let's remember them. Uh, yeah, you can't forget Pat Quinn or John Riggers. Uh, that's uh, a good point, Marlene. Thank you, Marlene. Yes. Fantastic. Uh, Rohit, uh, if we talk about uh, the vitrification and cryopreservation and all that aspects of storage and, um, uh, you know, optimum conditions, how do you see the progress uh, in IVF before and after? Do, can you tell us where is that brick point where, you know, we, we knew that there yeah. was, yeah, you got it. Yeah, thanks, Nabil. Yeah, no, I, I'm listening in on this and it's absolutely amazing. And yes, there are, uh, inflection points in the timeline here where there was major advances being made. Um, and I think vitrification definitely was one of those from, you know, I, I'm new to the IVF community, but I've been in the life sciences for almost two decades. And and all the research and all the work I've done bench side and, and thereafter, biobanking has been at the heart of it. And, you know, when I think back to early days of biobanks and the same thing here applies in the IVF community, uh, you know, these specimens have been really managed with do-it-yourself infrastructure, and that's been good enough to get by for a while. But, you know, once you start thinking about how manual these processes are, antiquated, process-driven, are they going to safely scale? And with vitrification happening, we're now seeing an exponential growth in egg and embryo uh, banking that really is just huge across the IVF community. And the solutions in place aren't going to scale. And so we really brought together a lot of experts here at Tomorrow Life Sciences from a lot of different disciplines to address this issue and start to think about how we remove the manual uh, workarounds here and optimize specimen management and uh, really start to think about how we develop a new standard of care for the safety and quality management of these specimens while they're being stored. And I think really biobanking is at the heart of all of it. Automation, as we mentioned earlier, is gonna be another inflection point now. And how we implement that into the IVF laboratory in different spaces. Well, we're starting with the cryo storage piece here to make sure we can ensure quality, identity, integrity are just never compromised. Um, and really this comes back to what we call in biobanking as a chain of custody. And uh, in tomorrow life sciences, I hope that people can understand that we're taking this a step further digital chain of custody, modernized and advanced technology, really that takes it and gives us another layer of transparency. And we talk about data points. Well, now we can track these samples with much more clarity than anything else. So absolutely, uh, I think this is a new era for us with standard of care, working in partnership you know, you know, with these clinics has been huge. And for me personally, the, the evolution here of change has been in the adoption by the IVF community of our technology has been amazing to watch. And I think that's one of the things for me that's very different because when you introduce these kind of change, process-driven laboratory changes um, back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, four years ago, it, it wasn't as adoptable. And now I'm seeing a lot of people with an open mind wanting to see that change because they see hey, why aren't we using better technology? Why aren't we advancing this further? We've gotten along really well with our infrastructure up until now, but we could be doing more. Yeah, and, and, I think and, and we, we will expand on technology a little bit more uh, uh, later, but um, I was curious about the slow freeze versus the snapshot freeze. What that is there any substantial difference in survival and, and uh, uh, and and uh, outcome. Uh, if anyone in the panel can talk about that, I could talk from uh, the clinician's perspective. I was trained uh, back in 2005 in the UK, and I remember that they used to use slow freezing. The embryos that I was handled to transfer when I was in training were frozen embryos because embryologists didn't expect to have a good chance of achieving implantation. Then uh, I I met uh, Kuwayama. Uh, Massa, and just completely changed my mind and ab about what could have been achieved with or through cryopreservation. And from having probably, I don't know, 60% survival rate, 75% survival rate uh, for embryos, 50% survival rate for eggs, just being able to talk to patients about cryopreservation, universal cryopreservation for PGT, egg freezing for uh, fertility preservation for social reasons for oncology patients uh, and going up to 99 98 percent survival rates that's just unbelievable 
So from the clinic, I completely the agree with Alejandro there. My mind. Yeah, slow freezing has been the, was was the way of, way of everything for a long time. Uh, but even in uh, any cell therapy world where you're doing a lot of slow freezing, introducing small molecules um, to manage the as a cryoprotectant, you're introducing artifacts, you're introducing other mechanisms that can lead to cell death um, and lower that viability. So I think the vitrification process has really changed that and the stats speak for themselves, as Alejandro said. Fantastic. So if I ask you guys one by one, what would be the ideal lab uh, uh, set, set up uh, as far as, you know, equipment and uh, technology updates and all that. How, what is the strict minimum that a, an IVF lab is required to have to be able to have a good outcome as far as uh, IVF outcome? And I'll start with you, Dimitri. What, what, what do you see? What is the minimum required in a lab to have as far as set up equipment, etc.? Sure. Uh... Uh, but before I answer this question, I, uh, I want to read uh, the names because <laughs> th this is uh, something that bothers me. Uh, somebody that I know has to be mentioned, doesn't mention, and since we talk about names, you ask about this, we have to read uh, Patrick Quinn, uh, I mean, the gardener already mentioned, John Biggers, uh, uh, Chan, uh, Fai Hiral, Bavister. Okay, thank you. Leave a label at Tronson, okay? But let's, okay, let's, 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 let's Now, uh, about okay, the equipment. Stop, Kim. Enough, yes. Kim. No more, Kim. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 about the equipment, about the equipment in IVF lab. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that the quality uh, of embryos uh, is uh, determined to start with by patient and stimulation. So, lab cannot improve embryo quality. Embryo, I mean, lab can. You know, maintain whatever is received from uh, uh, the patient. Um, equipment, as far as equipment, uh, if you're asking about quality, uh, I had I saw the best embryos uh, recently when I was uh, when I was um, uh, visiting a lab in, in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, uh, the best embryos I ever seen. These people use it's a large program. I'm mean, not very large. Maybe 500, 600 cases a year. Uh, they use desiccators. Yes, desiccators. Two hundred dollars a piece. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, and what they do, uh, they uh, and they have this very archaic system where they uh, fill them uh, with a mixture on a spot and fill them up, close them down after they check fertilization and leave it in incubators for five days. The best embryos I've ever seen. Uh, uh, you can you can you may say about what made them the best. What made them the best embryos? Uh, the best, uh, uh, the okay. largest number of cells. Uh, uh, very uh, clearly defined, like a lot of embryos, uh, a large proportion of embryos with a very clearly defined in their cell mass. But the biggest thing, of course, is you want to have a not just a large. Blastocysts. You want to have a lot of cells on it, uh, and uh, uh, that's what they have. Believe me, I know how a good embryo looks even with, without any artificial intelligence. I can tell you. So <laughs> they have a lot of a lot of really good embryos, and uh, um, you need to have a great physician who knows how to uh, uh, stimulate patients so that she would have the best quality eggs, uh, and uh, uh, and then uh, once you have this. X, which will be determining for the most part the quality of the embryos. Uh, if you have uh, the system where each of the patients have have their own confined space, which doesn't change for five or six days, that's what you want. I will tell you, for example, that even in the modern, like we have this uh, uh, K K system incubator, it's beautiful. Like it mixes gases by itself. You know, it has this. It tracks, you know, temperature. Every time you open it up, it witnesses and uh, whatever, so uh, makes a note for a lawsuit. But when you open this one one area, the whole thing is opened, opens up. Uh, it's not a single ch separate chambers, just one big chamber with multiple doors. Who made this design for you know thirty thousand dollars or whatever the piece is, maybe more than that. I have no idea, but but this is much much better than this, this machine. 
and, and it's only 200 dollars of that much so uh, i think that as far as quality uh, equipment you have in the lab i mean the uh, i mean how advanced it is is absolutely relevant the only the question is uh, uh, if you have a scale if you need a scale if you have a lot of cases you want st standardized procedures and uh, to have high through output it's a it's another question uh, which when well, you need you know it more advanced technology and, and all that uh, but to find the right balance between technology uh, and high through output and uh, delivering quality embryos this is where i see the challenge very good i'm gonna Dimitri, would you favor more automation or more people power in that case to get higher throughput oh, what do you I, think I, the uh, says right now? i uh, honestly uh, I, I, I'm trying to, to be uh, aware of what, you know, innovations are coming into play in IVF, uh, which increase productivity or try to increase productivity. Uh, and uh, I, maybe I, I, I did not see, you know, what you guys are offering. I saw the device which is trying to improve vitrification, you know, uh, it's automated vitrification. I didn't think it's, uh, uh, it's anything that I would use in, in our lab. I, uh, uh, I don't think it's even improves productivity, you know, it just uh, uh, replaces somebody without improving productivity. Uh, uh, and I'm not even sure if it does replace somebody. But uh, uh, me, uh, I would say that uh, looking at the technology which is available, I would prefer more people. I just don't see the technology uh, which in, is intended to increase through output, which would feel me comfortable to say that, okay, so we can uh, begin uh, substituting some of the human actions with the machine. Okay, so let me ask uh, Gary. Uh, Gary, I know that you're very passionate about technology and, and automation aspects in the IVF lab. Do you see yeah. a, 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 a hope there? I do. I mean, I, I, I hate to, I, I will respectfully disagree with Dimitri for the, maybe the first time ever. Um, I, I think, you know, having, having work at a company that, that is very, very heavily into automation, um, you can, you know, you can go into a laboratory, you can see how automation helps. Now, Dimitri is hundred percent right. That automation has to be made for purpose made and has to work really, really well. Right. So, so let's, Let's take it out of the IVF lab for a moment and maybe I'll do something that you and I can talk about all day long, right? Would you rather hire 10 people to sit around and do library prep or would you rather have a machine sit around and do pipetting and library prep overnight, knowing that it's gonna do it right every time, never ask for a, a raise, never wants a weekend off, never gets mad at working at three in the morning. It just pipettes. Now that's simple because pipetting 96 well plates, 96 well plates is super easy. You can see how that automation helps. Now, okay, let's let's go to the IVF lab and say, okay, where do you where can you make that? Well, yeah. you know, when I was at that company, we talked to a lab about using one of their systems for making dishes, right? That's a that's a topic in a really really busy lab. That this lab was doing, they're doing over a thousand retrievals a year, um, and so they spend, you know, somebody two or three people spend hours every day making dishes. And when the lab director looks at those dishes, what does he see? He sees the inconsistency because when they're making when they're making droplets, the droplets he figured out range by about thirty percent, which probably isn't that big a deal. But if you want to do non-invasive PGTA, all of a sudden the droplet size—if you think no. it's twenty, but it's actually thirty percent <laughs> bigger or thirty percent smaller—you're getting different concentrations of DNA. Therefore, non-invasive PGT might not work, or metabolomics might not work, or whatever. So I, I think there are places where automation will come into the IVF lab. Um, and I think lastly, to on this topic, I think we also have to embrace technology and embrace things that make our lives easier. Because in the end, Dimitri, I think you can't look at this as I can replace somebody. Rather, I can take a machine that can do something really simple and let a human being doing, do something that only a human being can do. Let the human being go think. Let the human being go think about 
how to improve other things in the laboratory or, or spend more time with their family or whatever it is. I think that automation should be seen as an additive to allowing your staff to do things that are, are much more useful to you and your patients than just sitting around doing ICSI or, or tubing PGT cells or whatever. Yeah, I will say, Gary, if I, if I may just comment on that too, I think embracing this as an additive is excellent. It's a, it's a very be much better way to frame this. It's not replacing humans. Uh, we did a collaborative study with multiple sites on this and study is the right word here. We looked at this scientifically and we worked with Accenture and the sites to really look at how are we improving the process, the, the risks of cryo storage in the lab um, through automation, through software. And we showed some great stats there, greater than 90% risk reduction, 77% reduction in, in human error prone steps. That's not replacing the human. We still need the human. But that's just showing how we can be an additive help to it. And I think there's a lot more spaces from automation and genomics to, uh, you know, all the stuff up, uh, upstream from all the cryopreservation that would really be would really be amazing. So I think we need to think about where are those right, where are the right places? Because you can't replace the embryologist. You can't replace the human but you can add tools to their belt to help them be more confident in what they're doing and reduce that error. Well, uh, if I can uh, jump in, sure. uh, uh, and, and I saw that uh, Alejandro was going to say something and I, I, I got to agree with the uh, and, uh, I'm for solving the problems, okay? I want to solve the problems. I'm for that, but I'm against solving the problems which do not exist. Okay, like I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not worried about uh, metabolomics or uh, non-invasive PGS because they have zero chance, zero chance to ever come to IVF lab, and we can talk about this more. Uh, so, uh, if we have a real problem, like for example, I agree that uh, dishes preparation. You know, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can see how it can be automated, and I think it has to be, and I agree with you, Gary, on this one. Uh, this is a real problem, so let's f look for solution. Uh, but uh, from just, what, just Just to be yeah. specific, we're talking just about automation. We're not talking about technology in general. We're talking just about streamlining. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, maybe I went too far. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. I, but, but, but I'm entitled to my opinion. I hope I'm not going to be able to. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so let me let me ask Alejandro yeah. because he is a doctor. Okay. So what is oh, is there any uh, you know future of automation in the medical aspects of the IVF the stimulation? Is, is there any any yeah. window? Okay. I'll begin by trying to answer the previous question. What is the minimum that you would think that is uh, that you need to give be best results? And I think it's the same in the lab as for a clinician. Standardization. We need to standardize the procedures. It's not good if I'm offering 80% pregnancy rates this month and then 20 next month, and I don't know what is happening. As you know, we doctors have huge egos. And I think I am the very best doctor in Mexico. But I understand that I perform differently today than I will perform tomorrow. And this is one of the benefits of working with a group. We are able to standardize. And it, when it comes to automation and other technologies, I can clearly see the, the challenge ahead. And he's trying to change the set of mind. We're not in a race against machines. I believe that if we manage to work together the strong humans plus strong machines with very fluent and well-prepared processes will be able to outperform whatever we're doing now so yes from the clinical point of view if you ask me about a difficult patient today i will think about uh this cycle for five minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes and i will give you my opinion the chances are next week i'll give you a different opinion so we're working to develop ai to automate the uh, decision-making process of ovarian stimulation. This, of course, I don't think that a machine is going to replace me soon, and I don't think that it's going to better than I am or my team is, but it's going to give us a very standard base from which we will be able to make decisions. 
I think that uh, robotics are there for very complex uh, procedures, talking about very complex laparoscopic surgeries. So I don't see why a robot shouldn't take over egg retrieval. Uh, uh, the process, the procedure is very, very easy. Or embryo transfer, probably with the help of a human, but I look forward to automation. So we as doctors and scientists can gain more time to, to present the human face of the treatment and, and being able to, to spend more time with patients, spend more time reading, thinking, and telling machines what to do. I don't think that the time has come where machines will tell us what to do, not yet. Yeah, and uh, you, you remind me of a, a uh, study that was done with a, a, a U.S. fertility center, a large one, that they were measuring the differences in outcome by physician. So what they found was that the transfer technique was the main reason or the main factor that plays into that differences in, in outcome. So to your point, if you have an out, a, a, a robot that can do a transfer the same way exactly every time, you will probably knock that factor down, right? I, I have always thought that the best the best um, you know clinics should have a technician that does only transfer and and leave out that components from yeah. a physician I'll, I'll give you one example uh, when i was in training i was in charge of performing an audit for pregnancy rates in the clinic that i was uh training and there were two clear outcomes the first one that was the superficial one the the top clinicians talking about uh the clinic director all the consultants had the worst pregnancy rates. Why did this happen? First, because they were left with these very difficult transfers. And second, and this was the second important remark, we noticed that anyone that was performing under 200 embryo transfers per year were the worst performers. And, when, and after that, when I came back from holidays, after two week holiday, I actually did, I, I was, I didn't feel natural performing an embryo transfer. So I think that as you were saying, technicians, if they just focus on ICSI, if they just focus on embryo transfer, they just focus on egg retrievals, they will become better than I am. So this is why I believe machines will, uh, the automation has great potential. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if I can jump in here, Nabil, I think there's, there's some, there's a group another group in America that's done some really good work. And, and I will use the name of the doctor. Uh, Dr. Jerry Lettery at Seattle Reproductive Medicine has done some amazing work looking at artificial intelligence around decision making in IVF. Right. So my wife is a clinical IVF nurse and, and she can tell you when she works in a big practice, she can tell you this doctor is going to do this today, but this doctor is going to do that tomorrow. Exactly what, what Alejandro just said. So as a nurse who's sitting there every day, she can she can take the charts and put them in order, knowing most likely what that doc is going to do, and it's it's a different order if it's a different doc today, right? And but she'll tell you also that occasionally the doctor makes a decision that isn't what they would ordinarily do. Nine times out of ten they do X, one time out of ten they do Y, and maybe that's the art in doing IVF. But from what I understand of this data, what it shows is at least around decision making in. Um, during cycle about about retrieval right so it, it was a simple decision tree um, up the medicine down the medicine or stop the medicine and stop the medicine was cancel the cycle or retrieval right so there's sort of four options there and you know looking back at twelve thousand cycles it you know they were able to to look at the number of eggs retrieved and the quality of the eggs retrieved and show that the computer can probably do a better job or at least a more consistently good job of making that decision. So, you know, again, maybe that's a time where that doctor could spend an extra hour with the patient, not sitting around making decisions that, that are pretty simple to make. And in the end, not that, not that the nurse is making that decision, but the nurse can tell you what that doctor's gonna decide 99.9% .9 of the time, as can the embryologist, as can everybody in that room that's, that spends a, a couple of hours in that room every day. So I think, and I think Alejandro's right, it, that's not the only decision-making point in IVF. Right? We can also pair genetics with this if we have the idea that 
there must be SNPs. There must be things that confer yep. better yep. stimulation or worse stimulation or you need LH in this patient. Or this patient will do better with recombinant FSH versus real FSH. All those things, there's got to be genetic marks. There's got to be underlying genetics that, that tell us this. If we can make those tests, we can then create algorithms around getting better outcomes, more eggs, better eggs, better sperm, all those things. So I just don't see how artificial intelligence and, and computers don't have a lot to say in decision making in, in IVF down the, down the road. Gary yeah. Alejandro, may I ask a quick question around this too, just to get your opinion and how do we move forward on the AI front? And this is a challenge we had in pathology and in radiology and a lot of other fields. How do we make that move when you need, as Alejandro said so well, standards, data standards, that we're all doing things the same way so we can actually interpret the data and train AI, train machine learning to actually give us better confidence in, in the tools we're using when it comes to decision making? I'll let Alejandro go because he knows way yeah. more about this than I do. <laughs> yeah. I think step number one, we need to to control expectations. I think that we are about to sit uh, before the wheel of a Formula One car. And if we don't know how to drive it, it will be very easy to have an accident. And then the problem is that we're going to generate a very bad reputation for AI. And the risk is that we will leave another AI winter in, in, in our field. So I think that the key answer is responsible introduction, introduction of new technology. We need to understand the limits of technology. What we have before us is narrow AI, it's not general AI. This means that uh, small changes in specific protocols from individual laboratories will uh, change the performance of AI. So collaboration is a key. Of course, uh, data, the, the size of the data is very relevant. Nowadays, it shouldn't be a problem with data augmentation, with the ability to generate synthetic data, if we know how to do it, it shouldn't be a problem. We need to understand that just trying to develop AI with the brute force of a massive data set is not enough. Uh, the quality of the technicians, the, the knowledge of, of the mathematicians be, behind this is crucial. The other uh, major challenge that I foresee is that we need to educate ourselves. Radiologists are not physicists, but they understand the basic principles of RMAs or uh, X-rays. And we, as scientists, doctors and biologists, we need to understand the basic uh, linger of AI and how it works so we can understand the papers that are being published. It's not rocket science. I believe that AI companies, and I represent one, are knocking on our doors trying to push some products. So how do we perform quality assurance for this? How do they yeah. perform fine tuning? How, how can we make sure that their AIs are performing as good in my clinic as they are performing on papers? As doctors, I used to tell me when I was learning how to perform surgeries, books do not bleed. So this is exactly the same. The papers don't bleed. So we need to make sure that AI performs under specific conditions in our labs. And we need to learn from that, how, how to do that. Yeah, I, yeah. If, if I might jump on top of that, I, I agree 100%. I think it all comes down to data quality and, and long-term quality assurance of, of the test. You know, I used to work at another company that, that created an algorithm around calling simple PGT results, right? So that the simple ones could get called. So, you know, the, the goal was to call as many as possible and have humans look at as few as possible, right? And so when, when we were discussing that, you know, I had the same question Alejandro had because in, in America, we have New York State accreditation and New York State's, the first thing New York State's gonna ask me is, that's great that you showed me how you, you made the algorithm, but how do I know the algorithm continues to call embryos the way you told it to six months from now? You've got to have longitudinal quality control, quality assurance, you've got to have some built-in test that continues to, to measure the AI against what you taught it and told it to do and make sure that it's operating the same way. Not unlike humans, right? If, if I'm running you and if I'm running a really big lab uh, or a lab that has multiple laboratories around the country, right? Then it's, it's more difficult to ensure that the, that the technologist in lab X 
is calling PGT results the same exact way that the embryologist in Lab Y is doing, even though they may have been trained by somebody else, they're working on different time zones. There's a million differences, but you have to find a way to make sure that they continue to call samples the way you want them calling samples. So it's proficiency testing, it's quality assurance, it's quality control, external quality assessment, internal quality assessment. That's the key going forward to all the problems we have in this field, I think, all come down to somebody creates something, they don't want anybody else to know about it, they run off and act like it's secret, and then there's no, there's no sharing, there's no quality, there's no way to know, there's no collaboration, and there's no proof that things work. It's just, oh, it works, I said so, right? Yeah, and I think we, we need to be better about collaborating and, 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 and talking about quality, not just, I made this thing. I mean, I, I, if, if you know, I would like to talk about two, two examples uh, on how this could be approached. I believe that none of the companies are currently, currently developing AI in the world of IVF have the power, human power, financial resources that, that Google, Tesla, and these big companies have. And they have one big problem called underspecification. This means that if you train your AI with millions, billions of parameters, and then you slightly change uh, the light, there is a good chance that the AI developed by Google is not going to perform as expected. So can we tackle this from the very beginning? I believe that we can if we understand the problem and we can be very strict with quality assurance and fine tuning processes. The second thing that is very important is to understand again, as I was just suggesting, and I'll talk about the Kasparov law, this, this famous uh, former chess player. What he suggested is what we were discussing previously. A human, a machine, and a good process will always outperform a strong human. And the same first example should always outperform a strong computer. Because when we're developing our assistance, so I'm going to objectively I'm going to change the quantitative assessment of sperm and transform it into, sorry, the qualitative, and I'm going to transform it into a quantitative assessment. But at the end, you, as an experienced embryologist or clinician, is going to take the final decision. I'm standardizing the process. You are going to make the decision. So I think that these assistants are the ones that can change the game right now. And this is why these technologies are not to replace humans right now. Not That's replaced awesome. ever, in my opinion. But I think Alejandro, to your, to your I'm point, not going to see. yeah, I think we look at it through also the knowledge network lens, is to a neural network, if you will, where we're actually as humans, you, as a clinician, as yourself, taking the information that a machine might be giving you through these AI tools, feeding back your response to it giving it information back that feeds back into a larger network of other knowledge outcomes, whatever it might be, so that people can see that the machine can continue to learn from what you're saying you're doing. What, which egg did you really select? Which embryo did you really select? And telling the computer that so that it can continue to learn on itself and then other decisions that are being made around that same image, that same genetic outcome, PGT outcome, Gary, those are the things that then continue to bolster the confidence of the AI. So that when you do introduce noise, you're right, it's not about the size of the database and all the data points you're feeding it, but it's also it's how it's learning and we have to be the ones to teach it. Fantastic. I'm gonna go through the poll results, just in uh, quickly, and then we're gonna pick some of the technology example that are listed on the poll and then we can discuss them a little further. So our first question was, how advanced is your IVF lab from a technology standpoint? Uh, 16% said advanced, 79% said average, and 5% said old school. We ask, check some of the technology you are currently using in your laboratory. This is a multi-choice uh, question. RFID technology, 16%. E-witnessing, 11%. Thermal imaging, temperature control um, in cryopreservation, 47%. That's the majority. And AI, 11%. Sensors like pH and oxygen, and, and, and et cetera, 42%. And 20% for others. We asked 
would you use automation for biopsy and vitrification if such a technology exists? 37% said yes, 26% said no, 37% said not sure. And the last question was, how much information would you like to see in embryo genetic test? Um, standard PGTA, 26%, whole genome, whole exome, 11%. Uh, life quality assessment of a, a future baby and predisposition to certain diseases um, that was 21% and all the above was 40, was 42%. And um, would you like, would you guys like to comment on the poll results? I'll start with you, Gary. Some of them were quite interesting. Honestly, I thought, I know, I, I know I wear my heart on my sleeve, but I definitely was like, whoa, I forget the two that I was, that I was pulled back by, but but certainly, the, for me, the technology around PGT and, and that many people think that, that whole, em, whole embryo sequencing is a good idea and that we should be doing that tomorrow, um, it sounds fantastic to me. And as a geneticist, I think that's great. I don't know that we're ready. I don't know that Dimitri's shaking his head. I don't know that we're ready to discuss that with, a, with a, an embryologist, a doctor, or a patient, for goodness sakes. Um, but I'm a bit surprised that the embryologists are pushing for, let's get more information from the embryos, not less. Um, after, you know, what's going on now. But um, listen, you know, like you said, Nabil, I'm a big fan of technology. So anytime something new comes along, I, I'm going to explore and I'm going to, I'm going to, I think it's fascinating. Um, I'm going to have a good look at it. So uh, I, I don't think there's any stone that can, that shouldn't be turned to try to find ways to, to maximize outcomes and, and maximize humans doing what humans do best and letting machines do the, the silly things in the lab. Fantastic. Um, Dimitri, your comments on the poll results? Well, I was surprised, uh, pleasantly surprised that so many people uh, have equipment to monitor their uh, their uh, URs. You know, like 46% have this thermal camera to look at them. It's, it's quite impressive. <clears throat> yeah, I'm very skeptical about uh, uh, whole genome amplification. I don't think we need that. And uh, uh, this actually brings me to another little subject uh, about the future of uh, uh, embryology, because this, I guess, uh, um, underlying uh, subject of this uh, whole thing. Um, I think that limitation we have now with uh, PGS is number of cells. We cannot get conclusive result. We don't get as many cells as a CVS or MNU. Uh, and that's why we cannot do whole genome amplification because uh, the more granular you become, the more errors you will generate, the more confusion you will have because you want to be accurate, not just broad, right? Uh, and uh, I see the future uh, in uh, uh, having embryo implanted in the lab. Uh, and, uh, and then you can have implantation in, in vitro implantation, yes. Uh, and then you can have uh, uh, as many cells as you want to get a conclusive diagnosis. Uh, and you can uh, take this, uh, uh, I guess, tissue now, endometrial tissue, uh, with implanted embryo and put it into the uterus. Uh, this possibly may be uh, a way to get a conclusive PGT testing, uh, um, uh, which we don't have now. Today, PGT is a screening, right? And it's not as granular as a CVS or MNU. Am I correct on this or not? That's true. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think that um, uh, this would be my only comment. I really don't see any other things I would comment on a survey. Yeah. Is this something, uh, uh, this is for you, Alejandro, is this something uh, medicine can adopt artificial? Uh, I know there are studies that have shown that you can actually make artificial, uh, you know, uh, uh, follicles and, and um, replicate the environment for implantation. Is that something that, science, that, that medicine may take eventually? Yes, I really hope so. Uh, first, right now, the bottleneck in, in IVF is a number of eggs. And I think it's a very primitive way to generate eggs with a huge risk 
to the patient if we take into consideration, it's, it's a very low risk, but it's a high risk if we take into consideration the potential that, that of, of generating synthetic eggs, for example, from, from pluripotential cells are retrieved from, from fat tissue or from skin. Imagine now you have 100 eggs, 1,000 eggs. So I think that this is something that, I mean, I know that this is something that uh, is being looked into actively. We, as New Hope, as a group, we are performing research in this sense. And the same with sperm. Generating artificial sperm would be fantastic. Uh, about the answers given, I'm surprised. I don't know if I'm pleasantly surprised or not. Or not. I'm very happy to know that the technology for whole genome amplification is there. But I believe that this is a common mistake uh, to believe that more is better. I believe that we will be risking entering uh, into something similar with what happened with the Embryoscope and the time lapse at first. I believe that embryologists were very happy that the technology existed, but then when they learn the amount of time that they had to dedicate to actually make something out of such huge amounts of information, it was a nightmare. So what are we going to do as embryologists, doctors, to look through the whole genome? And then you have mosaics, and now you have metabolomics. And how are you going to rank the order? How are you going to prioritize the order in which you're going to drop for embryos? This is going to become more and more complex unless we allow technology to enter into this field, and I'm talking about AI and automation. So imagine you have whole genome amplification and you have one embryo that has 1% risk of developing uh, lung cancer. I, I have patients that I'm pretty sure are going, are going to move away from Mexico City just because the city is going to increase the risk for this baby that has 1% and you're going to have a huge impact in their lives. And you don't know probably when this child is 10 years old, he's going to be run over by a bus. So I think that having too much information could be dangerous and detrimental to daily practice. So we have to be careful. Thank you so much. Uh, Rohit, if we talk about uh, sensing technology and RFID technology and uh, tracking and all that. That's something that you probably are is more interested in. Um, where do you, how does the lab would look like if these technology, these, uh, some of them are already existent, but not as common. Uh, how do you see a, a lab in 20, let's say 2040, 2050, how does that lab look like from a technology well, perspective? I'm happy with the stat. 46% there on the automation side of uh, crowd storage, advanced crowd storage. I think that plays it right into this question. I, I think more and more labs are ready to adopt this kind of technology. I agree that we don't want to be overkill here with what we're saying is going to all be automated. This is not going to be an all-inclusive thing, but we need to be we need to be mindful and work with our collaboration with the clinics and collaborators here to make sure we're automating, we're we're using AI correctly and in the right places, so that in the future, and to be able to your question, we are tracking samples. Number one and foremost, let's standardize what we can standardize. Tracking of biospecimens, whether it's an IVF or anything, can be standardized. Our RFID tags. In this case, what we're using is our technology, allow for that. Because now you're taking this whole idea of scanning samples and barcodes or handwritten labels or uh, Sharpies on things, you're taking that out of the equation. You're making it more fluid. You're pairing that with software that can quickly read this. And you're bringing that out beyond just the process of freeze and thaw, you're bringing it out to the other parts of the laboratory space. And so when I think about that, you add in what we already have here with robotics and automating how the how the cryo storage piece is done into a tank and out. And we start to think about the software piece. Now we're talking about tracking not only through specimens, but all the meta information collected in the laboratory, the stuff that matters, the stuff that will help make decisions, the stuff that can help inform an AI tool in the future too. And also, hey, while we're at it, let's put some standards in there. Let's stop making things unstructured fields. Let's make them more structured. So in 2040, we will have 
data that has meaning. We will have automation that's being an additive feature to the, to the lab, not being seen as a replacement. And we'll have AI that's actually helping with decision-making. And no matter what the noise is, as Alejandro said, the little bit of noise right now can change the AI very quickly. But if we can create uh, new ways of thinking of better mathematicians and data scientists working together on how we address that, then we may have a future with AI and all these other things in, the, in 2040. That means that you're having better automation lab, better tools, software, RFID is another example here, just another technology that really can be simple, but transformative. Thank you so much. Uh, Gary, the use of AI in PGTA um, uh, uh, testing, the, the current form and how that AI should look like or should be like to be able to pull more information and better information, better selection. What's your what's your input in there? Yeah, I mean, I think, listen, I, I think there's there's a lot of things we don't understand about embryos. You know, I was talking to Dimitri earlier and, and said there's still, what, 35 percent of embryos or more that are euploid that don't implant. So so why is that right? What what genetic data can we extract from that? Certainly, some of those embryos are going to have, you know, lethal mutations. Um, there, there are going to be other genetic things that we just can't see for sure. Obviously, there's a whole lot of other things that go into getting implantation, endometrium, timing, a whole bunch of other things. But um, I just don't see how artificial intelligence, machine learning doesn't make this better. Again, humans can only do so much. You know, a, a machine learning or, a, or an AI can see deeper and more, which can maybe, even if it's not telling us, hey, we, this embryo is better than that embryo, maybe it's just, it's collecting data that says, you know, the computer can start putting the 35% of embryos that don't implant in this clinic. Why, what's similar, what's similar about those embryos and what makes them different than the embryos that did implant? I don't think that, that a human looking at that, I know I can't look at that data and determine that. I just don't think I can do it, even though I've been doing genetics for quite a while. I think machine learning AI could maybe look at that data set and give some information about ways we can make genetic testing better or we can use the information yeah. better, or we can translate that to a patient better. Sorry, I completely agree with you. And I think that you, you're spot on. This is not a one sense uh, way. This is a two way. Uh, I believe that AI can help us generate new biological knowledge. It can allow us to understand if we focus on asking the right questions. And I, I love what you're presenting. I absolutely agree with that. I thought you were going to disagree with me. You were so adamant about speaking. I thought you were going to say, I no, totally disagree. I, I love you. You've got it wrong. This, this <laughs> is pretty much what we're doing with our data scientists. It's like, okay, if Erika is underperforming in, in certain scenario, what is happening? What, what is the pattern in this scenario? And in this way, we're generating new biological knowledge. We're understanding better about sperm, embryos, and even oocytes. So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I, I really like the idea. So, I, think a, I think a good corollary here is, is this new group I'm working for. Um, most, most of what we do now is cancer, right? And so one of the things that we're determining is that a tumor isn't just a tumor, right? There are individual places in a tumor. There are individual cells in a tumor. And every one of those cells has something to say about the cancer that that patient has today and the, the, the chance and risk of whatever cancer they may have down the road. So we have some really cool data that shows where residual disease comes from, right? It comes from clones in the, it comes from clonal populations in the tumor that were missed in bulk sequencing. So in bulk sequencing, we say, okay, we, we found that, you know, here's the tumor cells. We, we clear those out, you're cancer free, but you're not cancer free. You've got all kinds of progenitor cancer cells that are lying in wait. If we understand those cell by cell, individual cell by individual cell, then we can give much better risk associations. We can give much better diagnostics, right? We've got a group that's looking at, at early changes in your, in your esophagus, if you're a smoker, a vapor, or not, right? What they're after is a simple test. If you're going to vape or you're going to smoke, let your doctor do a simple test to look for the, the telltale changes of early cancer changes 
that you won't, you know, they're not, it's not a lesion yet, but if you can catch them when they're early, then you can fix it now, right? It's the same thing here. It's all about looking at data and delving deeper and deeper and learning more about ways to diagnose and treat problems. That's that's what AI and, and artificial intelligence mm -hmm. and, and machine learning can do. Just taking those data sets and pulling information that is would be hard for any one person to, to pull themselves. So if we go back to the strict application of PGTA and the AI that is currently being used, it uses the um, copy number distribution and, and patterns, right? To say, okay, this pattern has been successful in the past this many times, therefore it's going to be scored more towards normals or, or vice versa. But it uses only the patterns. It doesn't use any genetic information except euploidy. So when I asked you earlier, you were saying maybe look at gene expression or look at other other data points that you will incorporate in that call uh, besides yeah, I mean, just looking I, at you know listen i don't know you know there's one group in in the world that that it says ai right in the name of their of their uh their software uh i never understood why that's artificial intelligence to me it seems like it's just an algorithm like you have and like anybody else that does pgt everyone needs an algorithm to take all that data and 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 produce a result I don't think that's artificial intelligence. I, they still haven't been able to explain to me how, why they call that AI, but you know, maybe we'll get there someday. But in the end, you're right, Nabil, if you can take the patterns and SNP calls and all kinds of other data that's there, there, there there's got to be a way to delineate that data and start looking at subsets. And I would imagine that's got to be what Cooper's doing, right? They have as much or more data than anybody else in the world around embryos and, and transfer. Now it's always hard as the PGT lab to get results and, and get, get, you know, who transferred, which embryo, who got pregnant. That's always hard to get. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I commend Cooper for, for the, you know, for, for pushing this agenda of artificial intelligence and looking in the data for things that aren't there. I hope they continue to push and look for deeper and deeper sequencing and deeper and deeper information that can help us understand. Again, you know, poor doctor, you know, the, the poor physician sitting there says, I've got three euploid embryos. Now, you know, now we're going to look, we're going to look down the microscope. The embryologist is going to pick one, but there's probably something there, be it from looking at images or metabolomics or deeper genetics. There's probably something there to, to stride those embryos into the one, two, and three. And I think that's where we should be looking. Yeah, Alejandro. Uh, Gary, you... may, I, may I add yeah, one thing to this yeah, discussion? Please. I think it's really important. I, I Gary, I can, can agree with you guys more. To also look outside the IVF space and to a lot of other life sciences. Gary, I, couldn't, I was so happy to hear you use your cancer example here, or the tumor example. That's what I'm most familiar with, too, is, is, is the applications in those spaces. When you're talk, talking about trans, biological transomics data, metabolomics, proteomics, genomics data, expression data, all that immune profiling, we can combine those things against imaging data. And this is being done. We're doing this in big healthcare. We're doing this in other spaces. And, and we're making we're making findings that we would normal never made without the actual AI. And I agree with you, Gary, on that note too. What is AI? What's an algorithm? What's a business intelligence tool? And what's an algorithm? What's true AI? Yeah. But there is there is a need for this to be in our, in our community in the IVF space, a big need. And I know there's tools now out there, but again, uh, as Alejandro said, we need to be able to bolster those tools, standardize the way they're being used, the standardized, the feeds that are going into them and the outputs that are coming out. So I couldn't agree with you more, but I do think we can get some lessons learned and bring them in to the IVF space here. And it, it comes back to collaboration. I think if we're ready to collaborate, this will, this will happen. Yeah, no, I mean, I had a meeting with a guy this morning that's that's looking at, at the spatial relationships of cells and, and how one cell next to another cell impacts the genetics and genomics of both of those cells, right? That's, that's really deep thinking, but, but it's, it's spatial biology, right? So that a, a cell that's, a cell that's turned into a cancer cell will have an impact on cells around it, even if they, they weren't on that same path. Right. And so I think, again, you know, we have to look outside of just IVF to understand more about, about how genetics and genomics is playing 
and spatial relationships and, and other relationships, chemicals that, that, it, that the, the embryo comes in contact with, stimulation medications, uh, you know, protocols, biopsy, shipping, tubing cells. I mean, all those things are doing probably making small changes to these embryos that we, we'd be nice to be aware of. Yeah, that's, that, that, um, that's very true. Can I say something? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question for uh, uh, Rahit. Uh, uh, your uh, RF IDs, uh, do you have one for the tiny tubes for PGT? Uh, I think that's an excellent question. We definitely, RFID technology can be applied in any of those spaces. Let me put it that way. Is it small, so enough, the, small the, enough to put it on, on, on a tube? Uh, Ooh, it can it, we can get the RFID tag to be microscopic. You can, so it can okay. be yeah, yeah. This so is wonderful because I, I think, I think, think that that we need to further about that because that is absolutely yes. If if you're okay. feeding into this idea, how do we track the entire laboratory process? Then yes, uh, absolutely. The RFID tag needs to be on any plastic consumable thing that you can think of, down to the tiniest piece of uh, piece of plastic Perfect. that you can imagine. Uh, can you print a number on a tube with this uh, RFID? So RFID is a is a sense type of think of it as a sensor, right? No, sure, no, no, I understand. No, no, I understand. What, what I'm asking is, uh, uh, can because uh, as a uh, as an embryologist, I would not, you know, see this uh, uh, this uh, RFID. I would want to see the number. Also on a tube. So, can you like print a number with this RFID on a tube, or it's only RFID which can be read by hardware? The RFID. Oh, oh. So the RFID can be read by hardware. Uh, no, no, no. He, he by, is he is asking. Is. Can you make the label a hybrid yeah. label that you can read oh, it with RFID, label. The but paper also paper label. RFID yeah. and an actual it's label, cool. label, so that the human can see it, but the computer <laughs> can also see yeah. it at the same time. And, in, in best practices of biolinking, the RFID does not replace the human readable label. Let me put it that way. It so yes, we have a human readable label. Um, that's that's just going to be lay information, though. We're not going to be putting barcodes on there and things like that. Oh, okay. So, so it's really okay. yeah. well, It would be nice if you could. And I, I have a question for uh, Alejandro. 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 Sorry, uh, Alejandro. Uh, uh, I just want to clarify. Uh, you uh, you said that. Uh, uh, you see some uh, fluctuations in the lab, like maybe from month to month, or uh, like, or out, let's say you, you see uh, fluctuations in outcomes in embryo development in the lab. Like, what maybe one month it's twenty percent, you said, another month would be forty percent, right? Oh no, no. Uh, fortunately, uh, we have very good standards, but okay. but I know about. I mean, that's one of our biggest fears if we don't understand what went wrong we don't understand what we did right we're never going to be able to improve and i know about labs that don't even understand the concepts of kpis and qas and all the cues yeah. and they just are happy today because they had a 50 percent pregnancy rate and then the next one they're wondering whether oh, maybe so. had an impact because they mm -hmm. only had a 15 percent pregnancy rate so I, I believe that uh, that was just an example. Fortunately, yeah. no. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I don't have that problem. Okay, I just wanted to, wanted to confirm because yeah. I, 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 I was sure I misunderstood, but I wanted to confirm. And Gary, I have a question for you. Uh, I agree with you that uh, uh, we have to have quality data, right? Without quality data, you cannot uh, yeah. uh, make a valid conclusion. Not even the best AI, if you if your data set is not That's good. Right. Uh, will give you a good answer to just mislead you somewhere. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, in IVF, it's much more challenging to create a data set which would be good enough, regardless how large it is. It can be large but bad, you know, data set. Uh, then even in cancer, you know, uh, because uh, uh, I think that in our field, we still don't have a hypothesis or theory which is strong enough, which you can outsource it to AI, which would then just give you more numbers and validate ideas you already have. Uh, uh, I find it sometimes very frustrating when, okay, you analyze a huge database, 
but you have to have, have to make a hypothesis and then the data when you begin to really think about them you know you can make you can put together a publication you know a table whatever but you know that it's really not good solid data which you can outsource to AI instinct human yeah yeah you know Rahit and I were talking about the, the, that this morning right is is the the the, the people on EMR is like free filling in information right it, you can't have free filled information because then you can't you can't do anything with that data because it's yeah. not data when when you can write one thing and, and Rahit writes something else to to say the same thing so you're 100 percent right we've got to get better and stronger for AI and machine learning and all those things to work the, the data has got to be pure and clean. And yeah. if, in my opinion, now I don't do this for a living, but in my opinion, you have to have a pretty clear idea of what you want the outcome exactly. to be. Yeah. So you have to know where you want to be when you start, right? It's kind of hard to just say, I want to use AI and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get a data set. I'm going to do something with it, right? That, that becomes what you talked about earlier, which is a, a technology in search of a, of an end user, right? And, and I feel like we have that a lot of that in IVF is, is these yes. technologies come along and there, there's no end user and, Someone comes to IVF and says, oh, they got, these guys have a lot of money. Someone there might want to use this. Exactly. You don't want to have that. But I, I think if you, you know, I guess to how Alejandro's point is, is if you set out to say, you know, we, we want to, you know, we want to do this at the very end and we, we need to create a data set, a training set, and then a test set. I, I think if you have that, that plan going forward, I think you can get good data out of it, even out of an IVF lab. But if you just try to go to your EMR and try to pull a whole bunch of information to, to build an algorithm, I don't. I agree, it's not going to work. Yes, this is you know, this is. Know, I, I think we're in, we're one hundred percent right agreement that th this all comes down to the data that comes in. You know, junk in, junk out. Yeah. Basically. Now, I, I believe one of the beauties right now is that there's a lot of uh, human brain behind artificial intelligence. A lot about intuition is very important at this point. And one example is. For example, what we did with the AI that we developed for embryo ranking. Of course, we want to try and predict which embryo is going to give us a baby. And I would love to know if this baby is going to make it to, to Cambridge, but it's impossible. So we at first tried to predict implantation. 20% of implantation potential depends on how good I am at the embryo transfer and how good the lining is. The next question is, this is not good enough. What is the most objective way to assess an embryo? And this was PGT. It's not perfect, but it's the closest we have to a gold standard right now. Yeah, okay. We completely changed our approach and we focus on trying to train our AI against PGT outcomes. Now, if we just become too ambitious and trying to build our data set as large as possible, there's a risk of data poisoning. And you can learn for good and improve, but you can also uh, end up uh, with a worse training than you originally had. So I know that I, I'm just, just redundant to what you're saying, but the quality of the information is very important and this is a job of uh, bio uh, statisticians and, and data scientists. Now, there are other tricks. And now we can play with this information. We can augment data. For the computer, if we flip the embryo, if we rotate it, it's a completely different embryo. It sounds very silly to us because this is the same embryo. And if you rotate it, it's still going to be euploid or not. Now we can generate synthetic data. We can generate synthetic cycles. We have a 32-year-old patient with endometriosis with seven embryos, only two were euploid. We remove these embryos from the cycle, but the structure is the same. We have a 32-year-old patient with endometriosis, seven embryos, two euploids. Now we have a large data set, let's say 5,000 embryos. We can repopulate this cycle with embryos coming from patients between 28 and 34 years old and then play around the same embryos. I mean, we know if these embryos were euploid or not, it's just a different cycle. So if we get creative, and FDA has already approved two oncology drugs based on synthetic arms. If we get creative, technology could be on our side and we could, could speed up the process of learning. I believe this is one of the beauties of, of AI right now.
So you embarked in that experience of developing an AI solution for embryo selection, right? Based on morphology only. What was your experience like? And, and do you think there is a room to add other components in that AI selection? Oh yes, this is not Erika against the world. This is how Erika can improve the information coming from the time-lapse. How can Erika improve uh, the decision-making process of a good embryologist? How could Erika add to the results from PGT, from metabolomics? How can the information that we're getting from sperm, we, we have another AI to uh, track individual sperm in real time to assist embryologists in selecting which sperm has the best potential to be injected. We can extract this information from this individual sperm and to feed Erika with this information and make it even more accurate. So again, this is not Erika against the world. This is just one tool. And when it's going to be added to another tool, it's only going to become better and better. So our experience has been very, very good. Erika has been a standard protocol at New Hope, Mexico uh, for one year and a half. We have, and, and we have presented this in ASHRAE uh, in a couple of posters and one oral presentation. We have a clear uh, difference between trans embryo transfer having good prognosis against those with poor prognosis. And we have found also a correlation between uh, Erika's grading and miscarriage rate. It's a long way to go. It's a long shot uh, to claim for this. This was just a pilot study. This was actually a result from an error analysis. Uh, so again, we're very happy. Uh, clinics using Erika so far, uh, except for one that's been very, very challenging because they have a completely different lab set completely different protocols, which Erika was not used to. It's training now, we're training it in, on a larger set for that specific clinic. We have found that Erika, I'm not going to mention names, but there's one time-lapse that seems to be custom built for AI. And there are others that are a huge challenge. Yeah, I mean, you are acquainted with different time-lapse. There are some in which they shout at the circle shows tends to show incomplete embryos and ai is not going to is not a crystal ball it's going to try and make a prediction based on what it sees and if half of the embryo is missing it's going to give you probably and not the best prediction so there are some differences in time lapse i mean i'm, I'm as you can see i'm passionate about uh, ai i'm literally speaking uh i'm Every day I'm leaving my my clinical practice just to focus more on on developing AI. Awesome. Rohit, sorry I interrupted you earlier. Uh, go ahead with your, uh, with your comments. Rohit? Oh, oh, no, no comment. There was more of a question to Alejandro uh, around natural language processing's place. Uh, it, is a, it is, you know, part of the AI umbrella. And so, you know, I, I think it's it's a relevant piece here when we're talking about unstructured data and the uh, variants we get right now, there is no standards right now, but if there were some, uh, you know, in terms of uh, clinic to clinic notes and things like that, do you see a place for natural language processing? Are you already using it in some capacity? We're not yet. Uh, there is a group, a private company here in Mexico that has invested huge amounts of money to digitalize uh, legal records. I'm talking about lawyers. And they have found amazing uh, correlations between certain phrases that win cases in, uh, with certain judges. Very, very interesting stuff. So we're in, in initial talks, initial conversations with this group, try and understand how they build their natural uh, language AI to extract relevant information and see whether this is something that we could explore with medical records. But the problem is that sometimes as doctors, there's some things that we believe that are so important that we won't forget and we don't write on the medical record. What we think is not that relevant 
And five years later, another doctor that is looking into the records just re-questions the patient and finds that this doctor just missed the point. So it's going to be very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. The challenge is huge and the mountain's high. Um, there's also one other form of data we haven't really explored or talked about much, and I haven't heard too much about since uh, since being in, introduced into this community, is patient reported outcomes. You know, what, where are we getting that data from? Where are we, uh, you know, collecting it? Because a lot of stuff doesn't end up in the medical record. And the uh, inferences we've made in immunology through our epigenetic study, uh, excuse me, epidemiology studies, uh, have been significant when we look at patient report outcomes, what they're talking about in social media and these support groups and things like that. It really, it really has been informative. Has there been any work in that space um, as that's another form of, you know, in, inferences that are important to AI? Absolutely. Um, well, certainly, I mean, I think certainly Rahe, in, in America, Every egg that gets retrieved, if you if you put your data into the SART CDC registry, there you know you have to tell whether the patient delivered a baby or not, and that is almost always self-reported by the patient, right? Because they, they walk out of the IVF center eight to ten weeks, so so there is a lot of self-reporting of did I have a baby, and you try to get the information how much did it weigh, when was it, all those things, right? And most clinics now have to have someone dedicated to simply calling patients in October, November, and December to try and get this information so they can put in their, their CDC SART database. Um, so there is self-reporting. I'm 100% agreed. I think that the way we're going to get farther faster is, is apps that you, you feed to the patient and the patient feeds back. Because the more yeah. you give to the patient, the more they're going to feed back to you, the more information you're going to get, and the, the more you're going to find out about your end user that you didn't know before. Yeah, well, and, and possibly if, if, if the AMR system have a, a way of passing some of that data directly into reporting, that will also add a lot of common knowledge that other researchers and scientists can tap into. I know SARS, you can extract a lot of information, but there are other information that are difficult to find, except if you are digging into an AMR system. Now, talking about the lab of the future, uh, there's another way in, in which we can use uh, natural language and we're actually using it. When you are busy with the microscope micro manipulating and you don't have an extra free hand to click the computer, you can mm -hmm. ask with a voice command like see rank. So I think that talking about the lab of the future, I dream about this lab where everything is augmented reality and you have the lab supervisor just giving orders to to the computer to give you feedback about quality assurance and quality controls. And hopefully, yeah, there was an interesting question. Sorry, uh, I don't know if you read it here on whether uh, would there be same compensation after having automation in the IVF center? Uh, and I think it's a very interesting question because this is something that moves us all. We all want to have a better life. And if you're going to reduce my salary, because you're going to automate the process, probably I'm not be, I'm not going to be as happy. And I think that there are going to be two different kinds of scientists, uh, sorry, two different uh, kind of practitioners in the IVF world. Technicians, highly skilled technicians, which will follow orders from AI, and the scientists that are going to tell the computers what to do. So I think that pretty much the question is open for everyone. Where do we want to be? We might even be get a, uh, We might even get better paid if we if we really commit to to understanding the technologies that are to come. Awesome. Well, we are uh, getting close to the end of the webinar. It's a it's about one hour and a half. Uh, I would like to. Uh, give you guys a minute to introduce your organization or your interests, uh, and then we will continue wrapping up the webinar. And I'll start with you, Rohit. Uh, maybe you can also talk a little bit about tomorrow technology and what does it do? Thank you so oh, much. Oh, thank you, Nabil. Yeah, that's great. So uh, I'm, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer representing Tomorrow Life Sciences. Uh, tomorrow Life Sciences has brought to the table robotic automation and software. Uh, for managing the cryo storage process. 
Uh, we've done this through the advent of RFID technology, uh, automation of the actual crowd storage tanks being used. Um, and it's in an effort to move all the old antiquated manual processes that do are human and error prone. The issues we've seen in the news recently with, with loss, of, loss of samples to tank failures, all of that has now moving us into this modern era where we can safeguard life's most precious samples and making sure we're doing that with full transparency to the clinic, full transparency to the patient. And out of all of this, it's to equip the lab with the right tools. It's not to come in and say, this is the only way. It's to come in and say, we're gonna collaborate and we're gonna work with you so we can build a purposely fit system that can everyone can actually utilize effectively and, and, and start to break down this barrier of being scared of automation, being scared of robotics coming in and seeing it for what it is. It's a very, uh, very awesome system and I'm very proud to be part of this company. And I, I hope that some of the stats I laid out earlier can help start to paint this picture as Alejandro, you were saying earlier towards standards. This, these, these things help us start to bring in this area of standard of care, that this is a new threshold we can actually reach. And I think that's where Tomorrow Life Science is really excited to talk more about and collaborate with the panel further on this and others um, here on participating in this. Awesome, Thanks, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dimitri? Uh, well, uh, maybe I'll thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'll be very quick. Uh, 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 I'm one of the co-founders of this uh, company, uh, Vitro Nova, and uh, this is one of our products that will be available uh, uh, end of the year. It's the first in the world ergonomic semen collection cap. Uh, and we're also uh, developing uh, this little device. It's also uh, a semen collection cap, which has a, it's lab in the cap, so essentially you put sperm here and you take the sperm from here already washed and ready for IVF or IUI for insemination. So that's at least. Um, well, I guess uh, uh, that's pretty much it. I don't want to take more of the time. We're the best, uh, awesome. best year. Uh, uh, allocated time. I, I just want to actually, um, uh, I want to uh, uh, to ask Rahit that uh, I mean, or tell him that uh, I think that uh, uh, it's really very strong need to uh, have tracking of individual samples with those uh, RF uh, uh, probes uh, from the lab into into the uh, uh, testing laboratory. This would be very important. Yeah. So. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dimitri. Um, thanks, Dimitri. Um, Gary? Yeah, thank, uh, first off, Nabil, thanks for, for the opportunity. You know I love doing these panels because uh, they're just a lot of fun and you get to meet new people and you get to talk about things that you don't talk about every day. Um, I'm the chief scientific officer for a very small startup called Bioscribe Genomics based in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we have a whole genome amplification technology uh, that's quite interesting. It gives you uh, from single cells, it covers about 99% of the genome with really, really, really high fidelity. So we're able to make single nucleotide variant calls from individual cells and look at those, look at those calls and, and again in cancer, understand how one mutation has led to a cascade of other mutations and, and track those cells. Um, you know, whole genome amplification is, is an amazing technology. Obviously, it has a lot of place in, in PGT. And, and while we do do some work in PGT, one of our collaborators and founders uh, has a preprint, if anybody wants to have a look at it, of doing some whole embryo, uh, whole genome and whole exome sequencing on individual embryo biopsies in a real case. Uh, it's kind of interesting, interesting work for sure. So, uh, but, you know, we, we focus outside of the PGT world as well. Uh, and lastly, I would like to thank all my uh, all the other people on the panel. It was it was fantastic. So thanks, guys. Thank you. No, I would I would love to collaborate on that. We've tried full exam 
with the, the current chemistry of whole genome amplification, the coverage was not that high. There was probably less yeah. than 40%. So th this is really good to, to, yeah, to so see what the coverage would be like. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll send you the preprint, Nabil, and, then, and oh. then you can call me back. If you want to have a conversation, we, yes. can, we can definitely have that conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much. Alejandro? Thank you very much for, for the invitation. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I hope that I can get in touch with, with you individually because I really like what you're doing. Uh, I, I want to be the first one using tomorrow in Mexico. Uh, I love one of the ideas that you have about approaching oncology cells and approaching them as to try and understand how Amber behaves. Again, I, I'll try and get with you, with you individually. I am medical director for New Hope Fertility Center in Mexico, and I am uh, the CEO for a startup called IVF 2.0, who de uh, which develops AI assistance for the IVF world. Uh, we aim to, to just that to equip the lab and clinicians with the right tools to improve, uh, to standardize the results and to improve uh, outcomes for patients. We have developed so far three different AIs. Erika, which is an um, AI to assist embryologists in embryo ranking. Another one called SIV, which assists embryologists to select the best sperm to be injected uh, into each egg. Another, and another AI for eggs. We're exploring other uh, forms of AI and actually using current tools to assist in in performing quality, external quality assurance for the labs. So thank you very awesome. much. And again, this is a fantastic time to be in, in the IPF world. Thank you so much. Well, uh, Dimitri, Gary, Alejandro, and Rohit, thank you so much for your time. It has been really fun to discuss the horizon of technology in the future. In two weeks, August 4th, 2021, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, we will have a uh, webinar on the fate of 1PN, 3PN, and mosaic embryos from a clinical evaluation. Um, so if you're interested in knowing the outcome from PNs, 1 and 3PNs, or mosaic embryos, please join us in two weeks. Thank you so much, and uh, I will see you in two weeks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.